I'm so pleased that uh, Larry and his wife Betsy, we, or we lured them down from Maine to come talk to us because he's written a new book. Uh, I've read it, The Demilitarization of American Diplomacy. It is a great read, and uh, I recommend it to everyone. And we're going to hear more about it. Let me just remind all of us, many friends are here, that Larry Pope was one of the, is one of the premier Arabists of, of the Foreign Service. Uh, he served a distinguished career primarily in North Africa, but also as well. The, uh, ambassador to Chad and many other places, and uh, has a wealth of experience in the Foreign Service that he brought to this book. Um, we'll be delighted to hear some anecdotes that he left out of the book, uh, and, uh, and questions and answers. Um, <laughs> and he um, most recently was brought out of retirement to serve as our um, chief of mission, acting chief of mission in um, Libya, following the assassination of Ambassador Stevens. Um, the book is a strong critique of many of the current trends that are going on inside the personnel system of the State Department. I think it's very timely. Um, it has a lot of uh, points that AFSA, I know, is, is, uh, agrees with Larry on and is taking on as an advocacy issue. Uh, he has a very interesting chapter. He can save us all the trouble. You can save yourselves all the trouble of reading the 2010 QDR and instead read Larry's chapter on the 2010 QDR, which is a lot better to read. <laughs> and it makes and summarizes it quite nicely. Um, but uh, let me just, I'm actually going to read one sentence from the end of his book, uh, because after a chapter's talking about um, the, some of the experiences that we've all lived through, like the 2010 QDR, he talks about the need for reform. And he says here, a reform effort will have to be grounded in the emerging reality of the 21st century, not in nostalgia for the past. So I, I love that line, because it's something that AFSA lives with every day. I'm looking at some of my colleagues on the board. And so, with no further ado, let me introduce Ambassador Larry Pope. Well, it's great, to, it's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation to, um, to, to address this group. Um, I have some prepared remarks here. There's a story. Um, story about a politician in Maine who, uh, having prepared an oration on the 4th of July ceremony, comes and reaches into the wrong breast pocket and brings out his prepared remarks and begins in a stentor stentorian voice to declaim, Dear Aunt Agatha. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, but they're pretty short. They don't, they don't go on for too long. And, and with a group like this, um, a lot of things can be said. And, in shorthand. Um, few things are worse, I think, than somebody who last served as an ambassador almost 20 years ago now, um, lecturing on a golden age that never was. Bob's point about nostalgia, I think, is well taken. Um, my father, who joined the Marine Corps in 1941, used to talk about people who would lament the days of the old Corps when things were better. Some of those old core Marines that a lot of young men killed with their excessive fondness for frontal assaults. So I want to try to avoid that, engaging in anecdotal, you know, nostalgia for the past, a golden age that never was. And I want to talk a little bit, and what I what I talk in the book about is theory, theory, ideas. Foreign Service has never been an institution uh, that was much interested in ideas. Um, we and I, the worst offender in the days when I was still in the business, would get up in the morning and try to figure out what made sense, depending on what was on in the inbox or these days flashing across computer screens, right? Politics is contingent, we had that sense. And our get out of, get out of jail card is, it depends. Um, the problem with that is that in a theoretical void, uh, other ideas, bad ideas, can, can infiltrate and fill in. And there's a price to be paid for that. But something I learned um, after, I, after I retired from the State Department and went to work as a 
defense consultant, and I was engaged in, a, in an exercise called Millennium Challenge 2002. Um, the, there's a book by Malcolm Gladwell, in which, a chapter of which talks about Millennium Challenge 2002. And in brief, the premise of that big exercise, very expensive, $100 million or so, involving the movement of tanks and planes and, and ships at sea, was that and it was to, it was to test was designed to test a, uh, a series of concepts that were modestly entitled the revolution in military affairs. That's RMA for short. And the premise of the RMA was essentially that um, we had computers. Bad guys didn't have computers. We would be able to use information technology and computers to outthink them and outsmart them so that we could fight a major contingency operation, or MCO, finish it off in 60 days, and come back and, and do it again in 90 days after we wash the tanks off, and that sort of thing. And the, with, our right, with our left hand, we would be doing a counterinsurgency, which was a lesser included sort of you know, uh, problem. Well, all that collapsed, um, of course, in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. But I remember standing on the steps of uh, Carlisle Barracks, uh, Hall at Carlisle Barracks, with Paul Van Riper, who was a Marine, former retired three-star, an intellectual, although I think he probably wouldn't like that term at all, and saying, and saying to Paul, you know, it's a good thing nobody would ever fight a, a war based on this nonsense. And Paul said to me, you're wrong. He, they will. And if, you know, not too long after that, they did in Iraq. Did. The Rumsfelds fiddling, fiddling around with the, with the war plan was premised in large part on the RMA ideas. Um, since then, um, in the crucible of Iraq and Afghanistan, our military services have managed to more or less reinvent themselves. Um, David Petraeus's counterinsurgency doctrine is the least of it. And what they did was to sort of rediscover the ancient truth that war is a branch of politics. They may have overlearned that lesson. I would argue that they have, but that's a subject we could talk about another time. But there's nothing in our world, in the world of the State Department, like this, analogous to this. There's been no reevaluation of the disasters in Iraq and Afghanistan, in which so many Foreign Service officers have uh, served. Closest thing I guess we have to it is the QDDR, and uh, Bob made, made mention to this. And I read it, so you won't have to. <laughs> it's two, 242 pages of dreadful bureaucratic prose. Uh, mentions the Foreign Service only in a couple of places in the context of making it easier for lateral entry to take place, which you can argue about. Much of it involved a turf fight between AID and state, as, as many of you know. Its core principles are well summed up in its opening vignette, which was drafted by someone innocent of any knowledge of foreign affairs, <laughs> in an effort to sort of humanize the, the prose of the whole. And you may remember that if you got that far with the opening vignette, what, what it involves, and it's intended to illustrate the, cure, the core principles of the thing. There are two people in a jeep somewhere in the world, not further identified. Um, we haven't ridden in Jeeps for a long time in that world. But, so, they're, so they're riding in a Jeep up to a remote, remote valley somewhere. One is a State Department official. Uh, the other one is a carefully gendered development official. Um, and they are have the modest intention of going up to the village and doing two things, eradicating uh, poverty and elevating the status of women. They have been preceded in that village. It sounds a little bit like Yemen, uh, <laughs> given the context. They've been preceded there by an alphabet soup of other agencies, because this is all going to be an interagency effort. Um, among them are uh, agriculture, justice, and more, but not apparently the CIA or the Defense Department, because these are good works, after all. Meanwhile, as we all know in the real Yemen, um, not the one in a galaxy far, far away, last week our drones killed several score people, many of whom may have deserved it, even if a few didn't. 
The QDDR reflects the mantra of 21st century statecraft, which is premised, and I quote here from the State Department's website, on a decentralization of power away from governments and large institutions and towards networks of people. Networks of people, and that, that was added. Yesterday I took a look at the State Department's website, uh, and under the rubric, 21st century state, statecraft, and to my surprise I found that Libya, Libya of all places, is touted, touted there as a great success. Um, and I can't resist quoting a bit from the, from the reference to Libya under the 21st century statecraft section of the State Department's website, even though it's only approximately written in English. Another example of our innovations in development policy came in Libya, where our diplomats engaged immediately with the new government to provide support for a new strategy of post-conflict stabilization using information networks. Post-conflict stabilization using information networks. The buzzwords just keep on coming. A leadership team formed a plan called eLibya to increase internet access throughout the country. The Libyans hadn't known about the internet before, apparently and leverage this information network as a tool to grow new businesses, deliver government services, improve education, and interconnect Libyan society. Now, there's not the slightest word of truth in any of this. None of this happened. I was there. Believe me. There was no such ministry. It was briefly... I don't know. There's absolutely no word of truth to this. It's a patronizing fantasy to suggest that Libyans need American tutelage in the uses of the Internet. There's a fundamental problem, I would argue, with this kind of magical thinking. It may not get people killed like the revolution, revolution in military affairs, but it has a damaging impact on our national security. Diplomacy is a particularly slippery trope. I'll spare you a lecture on the terms of diplomacy and diplomat. If you want to inflict that on yourselves, you'll have to buy my little tract but they date to the French Revolution, not earlier. They rise with a world of sovereign states, a peculiar notion that Togo and China and the United States are all juridically equal, the world we live in today. Now, this isn't the only way to think about the world by any means, and it would have horrified medieval Europe, not to mention the Ottoman Empire and China, uh, as a moral and practical absurdity. But diplomacy and diplomats co are coterminous, roughly speaking, with this world of what political scientists like to call post-Westphalia states. If you think these monsters are on the way out in the 21st century, in the information age, then I think you'd have to conclude di diplomacy is too. And it's a dirty little secret in the Beltway that many people believe precisely that. It may account for the fact that there's so little outrage about unqualified ambassadors in places like Argentina and Norway, and a general sense that these are relics of another age. Talk about a flat world has a long history, from Immanuel Kant's Universal Peace to Charles Fourier, a utopian socialist of the 19th century, whose ideas found a fertile reception on American soil, to Thomas Friedman. A generation ago, in 1991, a French diplomat named Jean-Marie Guéhenneau uh, persuaded himself that nation-states were the wave of the past. Economic globalization, he wrote, would soon give rise to a society, a global society, which is infinitely fragmented, without any, mention, without any memory or solidarity, finding its unity only in a weekly succession of media images a society without citizens, and thus, in the end, a non-society. It's better in French, I think, probably. But it, it, was a, it was a dark French vision of a world of Velveeta cheese and fast food. <laughs> More recently, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who, of course, shep shepherded the QDDR to completion, the first QDDR, I suppose we have to say now, since the second effort was launched a couple of days ago, suggested that while other nation states with old-fashioned vertical command and control hierarchies were destined to wither away. Given the networking prowess of the United States, our power would only grow. 
and she envisioned in a 2008 article for Foreign Affairs a utopia in which American officials in Washington would receive instant updates on, on events occurring around the world, networked to counterparts abroad, able to coordinate preventive and problem-solving actions with a vast range of private and civic actors, not apparently including governments. Now you could ask Vladimir Putin whether that sounds like today's world. Gayano's weekly images have been replaced by a news cycle which plays in an endless, in an endless loop. So we can watch the carnage in Syria in real time, virtually real time, but without being able to do much about it. Like his predecessor, John Kerry spends his days working in this world of states, and it appears to have a good deal of life in it yet. Maybe as we are threatened by submergence in a global soup, we cling to the things that make us different with greater intensity. And maybe this backlash against globalization accounts for the fact that it accounts for a lot of things, from a referendum in Scotland over whether to dissolve the 300-year-old United Kingdom, to anti-immigrant policies in Europe, to Islamic radicalism, but that's a subject perhaps for another day. It is, however, a peculiar uh, thing for a foreign ministry to, endure, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to try to wish away the world of states. One symptom of this is the vote for global things in the State Department used to be content with the word international. Increasingly, the institutional focus of the building across the way is not the world of state power, but gauzy global concerns located somewhere in the ether. Of the 2075, 75 senior officials on the State Department's uh, organization chart below the rank of, of undersecretary, an astonishing total of it in itself, only six the assistant secretaries for the regional bureaus are focused on specific particular places. There are officials at the State Department in charge of global intergovernmental, global intergovernmental affairs, global criminal justice, a global entrepreneurship program, global youth. Ronan Farrow, of course, was a recent incumbent of that office. Even the old International Organization Bureau, where I used to work, now says it is charged with global engagement whatever that means. While the State Department is attending to the world, welfare of the world in general, other institutions have increasingly supplanted it in the management of the world of nations. Since 9-11, the military, industrial com military intelligence complex has more or less doubled in size, and in this administration, power has moved increasingly to the White House staff. I used the figure 300 for the National Security Council staff in my book. Um, I don't know whether it's accurate or not. There is no public figure, which is a, which is something which says something in itself. I've seen the figure 600 uh, in other estimates. The National Security Council staff, not the not the National Security Council, please, the name under which it issues press releases, but the National Security Council staff. The staff of the President's National Security Advisor is operational to a fault. It's essentially an off-the-books agency of government. The old Scowcroft model having long ago been uh, uh, jettisoned of the NSC as a staff, as, a moderate, mo as an honest broker. I ran into a recently retired senior director uh, at the NSC the other day, and he explained it to me this way. When agency recommendations coincide with mine, I, I endorse them and forward them for, for, uh, for approval. When they don't, I invoke the president's authority and, um, and change them to, to what I believe is the right course, and either way, I win. That's the way it works. Now, I would argue that this centralization of power in the White House and the decline of our diplomatic institutions to which it's related is part of the reason why the conviction is growing in this town and elsewhere that the president's policies, while often uh, with, adopted with the best of intentions, frequently lack purchase in the world. I'm not suggesting a return to the old diplomacy conducted by gentlemen in striped pants, 
that died a century ago uh, on the Somme and Ypres and, other, and with, with the guns of August in 1914. Final blow was struck at Munich. It had its points, had its, as well as its drawbacks. It was a sort of ideology, ideology of peace with a heroic view of the profession. It's well, it's pretty well, it's well summed. I don't know how many of you know a, a movie, um, it's a post-war movie set in the 19th century by the French director Max Ophüls. Um, there are two, there's, there are, Max, uh, uh, Charles Boyer is a general, and Vittoria da Sica is a, an ambassador. And they are contending for the hand of the beautiful Countess Danielle Darieux, which is certainly worth contending for. Uh, and Charles Boyer challenges Vittoria de Sica to a, uh, a duel on the grounds that he said that if diplomats did their work, there would be no need for generals. What we're left with is diplomacy as war by other means is by no means as inspiring and, and consequential, but still a very serious business indeed, one which we neglect at our peril. <coughs> Nor am I arguing that the problem we face in a world of states can be managed on a bilateral basis. From climate change to cyberspace, they're often international in scope. Cyber war is a classic example <coughs> of the need for a political strategy not simply premise, premised on the search for dominance, which is the strategy we're now pursuing, but one which includes a negotiating track aimed at, at establishing norms and preventing the further militarization of cyberspace, in which the United States is taking the lead. This would be a serious task, a classic task, for a serious American foreign ministry. But on my reading, for all of its global preoccupations, the State Department lacks the capacity and perhaps the stomach for taking it on, since to do so would involve a confrontation with far more powerful institutions. No talk about diplomacy and its discontents is complete without a reference to George Kennan. In a typically dyspep dyspeptic essay written in uh, 1997 titled Diplomacy Without Diplomats, Kennan sur surveyed from an Olympian, but not entirely unsympathetic uh, uh, posture, the state of the American Foreign Service. He thought it was far too large at 8,000, uh, not very good, but he argued that in a democracy which didn't respect the rule of the primacy of foreign over domestic policy, it was probably about as good as the country could expect. I'm not as pessimistic as Kennan about the ability of American democracy to support a first-rate diplomatic service. In Libya, the people I worked with were wonderful, and it was an honor, to serve, an honor to serve with them. But I think things may have to get worse before they get better. President Obama told the, the NDU last year that without a change in thinking, we are going to get into more unnecessary wars, and he's right about that and institutional change would have, will have to, be, will have to follow from a, a, uh, a change of thinking and not 10-point plans. Maybe to end on an optimistic note, Bob, the new QDDR can move us in the direction of embracing the need for a professional diplomatic service in a world of nations. Thanks very much. I've tried your patience far too long. No, I, I, can, I can handle it, but now, now we've got the objections and the Q&A, <laughs> which are welcome. What's this guy? David Passage. Well, if no one else will start, I will. I have um, and right. taking off from one of your, one of your final uh, bonbons and, and, and paragraphs, you say that uh, you think the State Department lacks the, and I'll let you fill in what your phrase was. Stomach. Stomach. Uh, to take on... Uh, and then, if you imagine the monsters that it would have to take on Absolutely. to prevail in a sensible strategy, to right. prevail in a sensible approach to a sensible strategy, yeah. how does the State Department take on I don't have the slightest idea. Uh, I, 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 just, I just asked the questions, David. <laughs> right. I don't have the answers to them. No, no, no. no. Um, I, and and that's, you, you revoked another one, and that's yeah. a, a national security staff of 600. I have heard the same figure 
a far cry from the days when you and I dealt with and on an NSC, a Scowcroft, and even Condoleezza Rice uh, only had an NSC of somewhere around 150. Yeah, it's really a dramatic expansion, and it really, it's a telling thing that we don't know how big it is. And it, it is staffed largely by 24-year-old <coughs> campaign staffers right. whose proudest achievement is, I advanced Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope, we hope that Joffe Joseph, remember Joffe Joseph, anybody remember that name? Senior Director for Non-Proliferation at the National Security Council, who was forced to resign maybe six months ago. And so he dealt with the Iran dossier, a lot of serious stuff. Sometime Republican, sometime Democrat, classic Washington guy, because he was caught out tweeting um, about his colleagues in a very insulting way and had to, had to leave. And there are great people at the NSC staff, there's no doubt about it. They're, they're, they're temporary by definition. Mm -hmm. They're temporary by definition, and it's no way to run a railroad. Um, the objection is sometimes made that the president has a right to have his own people, and of course he has the right to have his own people. But it's not in his interest to centralize things in the way that he's done, leaving himself very little in the way of sort of running room between, between, the, state, with, between the State Department and the Defense Department and negotiating, among other things, with his own generals over Pakistan troop levels, I would argue. He doesn't agree pretty clearly. Susan? Uh, thank you very much, Larry. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, in your various conversations and research that you have done, you know, associated with this book and other, other things, that you have developed any kind of sense of whether the concept of meritocracy, particularly in federal government, still obtains any kind of purchase in an era when we've seen such an expansion of, I'll call it patronage, both political and personal, in how you staff government. Yeah. And, and just on, and what are the implications of that yeah. for us in general, but for the Foreign Service itself, yeah. and what we are based on, or have been based on, and for our future, right. if we have one? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, if we have, if I think that it's a, it's a, the attacks on government, government service, government institutions. Anybody remember Paul Volcker's sort of maybe 1990 massive study about you know, why we needed a, you know, career institutions and in government and why they were in the, on, the, on the decline? I mean, our politics today represents such, there's so much, so much of an attack on government that it's no wonder that institutions like the Foreign Service fall into, fall into disrepair. And so it's part of that larger picture, a sense that, um, you know, government is the enemy, right? And, and institutions like the Foreign Service are old-fashioned, and meritocracy, the old, the old notion of meritocracy is, is kind of passe. Everything is politicized. Um, everything is driven by the, by the in, this, in this town, by the, by the sort of passions of the moment. Uh, foreign, foreign policy decisions are made based on how they'll play the next day in the, in the, in the sort of, in the web. Um, <coughs> I don't know. I, I, mean, I, I think it is the part, as you suggest, part of a larger phenomenon involving the discrediting of government institutions and, and the, the, the sense that they don't need to be good, they don't need to be excellent. We can get along with mediocre ones. <coughs> yes, ma'am. <Susan. laughs> nice to have you. Um, I appreciate that uh, you have been an unflinching and clear-eyed and fearless diagnostician, mm -hmm. and I personally can't thank you enough. Uh, it's not in interval bureaucracies and State Department of Lease in which you've spoken, and that voice alone, I think, is, is um, quite exceptional. But I wonder what kind of reactions yeah. you have been getting to this. My, my concern is that uh, the frogs are still resting comfortably in the pot of uh, warming water. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, well, no, it's the, the temperature is going up, it and is. It, by the time it boils, it's it dead. <laughs> um, what they don't realize is the rising temperature, and, and I wonder what kind of reaction you're getting, and whether, in fact, any of that reaction has come from the active duty as opposed to the old man. Yeah, that's a good question, and uh, more, more I'm afraid from um, from people like many of us in this room uh, than from the current, uh, you know, folks who are uh, 
uh, fully engaged in, in the work of in the work day and in, uh, um, in, the, in their careers, working stiffs, if you will, have little time to think about theory and and uh, um, and ideas. And so the point of this little book is not so much to be a a Jeremiah about the declining state of the Foreign Service and our institutions, but to suggest that there are some bad ideas out there. These ideas about globalization, these ideas about you know the information age having changed everything, these, these ideas about the declining importance of a, of a world of state. Um, everything has changed in our world, there's no question about it. But um, that, that fabric of of, of, of the world based on the, based on sovereign states has a lot of life in it. Yeah, it's the one we live in, and we ignore it uh, at our peril. So it's that's the one, kind it's of the one we invented. That's right. And that's if right. We undermine it. That's right. I mean, I, I think you can you can get stuck uh, <laughs> when you sort of defend the premise of a world of sovereign sovereign states. You get stuck with, you know, uh, assertions in states like Russia and China that like to assert sovereignty and. You can, you, you know, there, there. It, it is a world in which um, so much uh, crosses borders, and the information age is very real. And I don't know what all of its implications are. I suggest, I've suggested, I try to suggest here that there's a kind of backlash against modernization and and this sort of notion that we're all sort of being submerged in a global soup, which accounts for a lot of what we see today and the renewal of nationalism in a lot of places in the world. Sam Huntington was right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yes, but my my point is that I'm trying to make a I'm trying to make a theoretical argument yeah. for Stephanie rather than simply an argument from you know nostalgia about about, about deteriorating institutions. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, your book makes a <clears throat> very powerful description of what's happened, if you will, in the U.S. coming about the militarization yeah. of foreign policy, yeah. how much of the power bureaucratic in order to defense. But your interesting discussion about the people in the QDR, about the two people in the Jeep. Yeah. We the assumption that you're coming out that within the State Department, which may be the least important part of this whole thing, what's happened with thinking is that there's been an aidization of foreign policy thinking. <laughs> the thinking about foreign policy is now all in terms of the sort of soft world of development. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the, a foreign ministry, an American foreign ministry, with limited resources by definition and the responsibility of advancing American security interests, first and foremost, that's the first duty, is not an institution for global benevolence. It isn't. It would be nice if it were, but it isn't, and it shouldn't be. So yeah, there's, there's some of that. So, and so while the State Department, and we haven't talked too much about social media, but while the State Department is preoccupied with the softer sides of, of power, other government institutions are getting on with the job without much counterbalance from broader political uh, you know, considerations. And so I would argue that that's led to some a considerable amount of imbalance. And I don't argue in the book that we need to, you know, uh, that, it's a, that it's a zero sum game in which military cuts and in the in, cuts in the intelligence budget ought to be balanced by an increase in uh, spending on AID and state. The argument's different, it's, a, it's an argument about ideas theory and the way we think about the world, the way the kind of world we're living in. I'm trying to make an argument that starts from the way the world is and that moves backwards to institutions rather than rather than the other way around. Yes sir. Uh, I find myself largely in agreement with your main points, but just to offer up a straw man uh, the the point you make about the you know the continuing relevance of state centric diplomacy and then you commented about the senior levels of the State Department Um, that said, actually, the gravity of influence in the State Department still rests with the regional bureaus. It does. Um, this entire structure of the way we do diplomacy is still very heavily dependent on the mission-centric intermissions. Yes. A lot of these offices in the State Department, this proliferation of special envoys, um, it's just that. It's really more window dressing, people without staff, people without you know, real budgets. So I, is it possible that you know, maybe you are being a little bit too yes. Pollyannish? It's quite not Pollyannish, but, but it, it's possible that I'm taking an easy, an easy, an easy target and beating it, uh, beating the horse to death. Yeah, no question about it. No question about it. But my my argument against that is that um, a lot of these bad ideas drive out good. 
they take they take a lot of the time of senior officials, even though you know Bill Burns and John Kerry aren't paying the slightest attention to any of them at any given moment in time. Or Ann Patterson in EA and for the rest of it, they still they cre they create to a dumbing down of the institution. I guess I would have to say in, in a fundamental way, which isn't to say that there isn't great work going on across that, that way. I mean, I know enough to know that that's the case. But unless that institution rediscovers the sense of itself as a foreign ministry and not some sort of grand, you know, benevolent uh, development scheme for the rest for the outside world. Um, it's going to continue to have a problem with a, with a sense of mission and purpose, which may be a, a infecting that permanent cadre of uh, State Department officials we call the Foreign Service, who are increasingly, as you know, supplanted by others from other, other places, and uh, a minority in the building now, a building that used to be dominated by, by Foreign Service officers in the days of Henry Kissinger and George Schultz, uh, I think you can now hold a, meeting, a senior meeting without a single FSO present. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, on this point, though, George Schultz comes to mind. I think if you ask anybody who was in the Foreign Service uh, any length of time, who was the foreign, who was the, the Secretary of State who made best use of what the Foreign Service has to offer? And everybody would agree on yeah. Schultz. Yeah. Some people would also say Colin Powell, except Colin Powell couldn't get his phone answered in, in, in the, yeah. the White House, yeah. so that limited him. But what those two had in common was they knew how to deal with yeah. organizations, and they knew how to find the person in the building at whatever rank who knew a fact. They dealt in facts, not just in countries, but in facts and in places where there were people who didn't think and act like us and whose whole purpose was not to affect polls taking place domestically in the United States. That's become so rare. I think with Kerry, we've got a man who knows that there is somewhere outside There's an the outside world. world, yeah. But he's one of the rare ones. Yeah. And he doesn't have a group around him who knows this. Bill Burns, sure, but, but basically he's, right. he's isolated. He's not using yeah, that. Two things are we ever going to have yeah. a, a, a State Department that works if we don't have somebody who at least has some sense of how to use what we have? That's rhetorical, I hope. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with you completely about George Schultz. Um, two things about him. One, his memoirs are a record of his long struggle with the White House. That, I mean, that's a leitmotif throughout those memoirs. Right? So he did that. He went. He knew he, if they, that if he wasn't to be marginalized as the American Foreign Minister, he had to do, he had to carry that fight, and he did. He did in places like Southern Africa, where he had a, a wonderfully capable team of, of pros. Uh, our policies ref, reflect reflect that. You know, people like Chet Crocker and Hank Cohen and David Passage. And so uh, that's that's one thing about. It. Schultz. The thing about Schultz, too, is that he was a Burkean conservative, right? He believed, he believed in institutions. He believed that they, 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 they go on after. He wasn't a pure political creature. Um, he was replaced by a pure political creature in, in, in James Baker, and for better, for better or for worse. And since then, the building has been more or less managed by a few people around the secretary, not, uh, increasingly not foreign service folks. Um, it's a, I don't see any indication, maybe you all do, you all know this far better than I do, that John Kerry is about to reverse that. that so what's happened to that, to that place? Ma'am? One pernicious effect of the gibberish uh, in language, the yes. uh, global development, the, the benevolent giant sort of miasma that, that we're in is that <coughs> the incoming FSOs, the candidates, the applicants, all spout the same language. And that makes me wonder to what extent the institution of the Foreign Service can be counted on to reverse 
any of this, um, you know, spongifying of our collective brain. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was out in uh, I was out in, uh, in the West Coast at Pomona. There's other institutions, Claremont, McKenna, great great private colleges. And yesterday afternoon, over at American University, they're both training and thinking about you know preparing people for for the foreign service. And somebody said to me on the faculty at AU, I won't name him. Um, some of you can probably guess who it was. We're not. We're not preparing people for this world, for the world that, of, of the foreign service and diplomacy. We're talking to them about conflict resolution. We're talking to them about various, various things. But when they get into business, they will have no training and no, no preparation for the world as it is. So, yeah, um, very much. And I think it's, you know, it's out there. Um, the think tanks in town thrive on this, on this stuff. Um, I don't know what to say, except that um, it, it all comes, <laughs> sound a bit like a Marxist, but it, can, it comes down to thinking rightly, <laughs> and, uh, and everything else will follow. Yes, sir. Uh, now, Laporta, uh, you have raised yeah. uh, the issue uh, of the purposes of our diplomatic installations abroad, whatever yeah. they be named. Uh, we are still governed by the Geneva and Vienna Conventions for the nitty-gritty of our protections and our privileges and how we operate. I mean, those are 200-year-old institutions, but increasingly we have uh, uh, installations that are there for other purposes, Absolutely. whether for inte primarily intelligence purposes or primarily for military uh, purposes, and maybe you could think of a few others. Uh, how do we square that circle? What, what's the remedy? Sure, big work. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it is a perfect point, and it's the right point. Embassies aren't platforms, they're not foreign bases. Platform is the term you use. There used to be, I don't know, this goes back a long time, and it, uh, it used to be a sort of an agreement about what the percentage of any given <coughs> diplomatic mission, diplomatic, diplomatic mission, right, which does exist under international law under those instruments you mentioned, what percentage of that diplomatic mission could be various other folks. It's gone. As far as I know, it's out, out the window. Out the window. Um, it is simply not recognized. And very often, I mean, I have my experiences only. I don't want to speak from recent experience. No, I won't. But um, I think it's a it's a phenomenon. What it means it means a couple of things, though. If what we've got in these places we call platforms, and we increasingly treat as if they were foreign bases, extraterritorial bases, we call embassies. What we've got is still, uh, at the top, a creature called an ambassador and his principal deputy. And the, he's got a letter from the president that says, you're in charge of this stuff. All of it. All of it. With the exceptions that we don't manage. You know, but but he, you're in charge of it. So unless you, and, and, and I expect you to run it. And we've got people out there in the world today who are doing just that. They're doing just that. But they're a minority, and the folks and I don't want to get into this sort of, oh gosh, the golden age has passed, and you know, the giants that walked the, uh, the earth are all gone, and I'm not even feeling so well myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you look at the overuse, two things, and you know this better than I do, if you look at two things, one, the overuse that we're making of a few folks, I mean, Ryan Crocker was sort of sent to place, place after place until finally they, he, ran out of, he ran out of gas, and um, uh, the increasing re resort to formers, people, retired folks, you know, to staff key positions. Uh, India, India, my friend Peter Burley, uh, spent 15 months, two, two incarnations, a total of 15 months running that place, coming back from retirement after 12 years. Peter's a great guy, terrifically able. Do you mean there wasn't a single OC in the Foreign Service who could run that place? Or MC? Not a single one in there an are, active duty? There are, there are people that I think I'm sure there are, but why didn't? So why then? Why then? Susan, didn't they? Yes. Thinking at the top and a broken selection process for senior jobs. Well, in that particular case, the Indians, you know, will only deal with somebody who they perceive to be. We think that's the case. We. I don't know how many of you have served in India. 
the Indians will deal with whoever they right. think they're serious about. I think, I think that's right. But, but then we could argue about that. But, you know, look around the world. When I was in Libya, I was, of course, retired. I was reporting to Beth Jones, who was retired. The, Eric, Eric Boswell was the, the S assistant secretary, who was retired. Does that make sense? I mean, does it make sense to, with the army if they couldn't, you know, when they when they need a new division commander, go around and say, let me see, didn't Joe, he retired a long time ago. I think he's living somewhere. Let's see if he'll come back and command the division. It's not a healthy institution that does this sort of thing. It's flattering to formers to be asked to do it, and some people want to do it. It's destroying the, the, Absolutely. the, the whole purpose of the career system Absolutely. for a leadership bench. And, and Combined with all the window dressers who are occupying a lot of positions in FTE, the opportunities for senior foreign service officers to gain the experience they need have been seriously eroded. And the other big thing that I would say to that point about window dressing, when the ARB that Pickering and uh, Admiral Mullen. Mullen did identified you know, the, the fundamental problems as being systemic uh, deficiencies of management and leadership, from my perspective, that has never really been looked at carefully, despite all the recommendations in the ARB and what the state has come up with. Because if you start looking, there's too many cooks in the kitchen. There are no clear channels of communication. There's no clear clarity about who is responsible for what. Right. You have too many different special this, special that, whatever, all with a piece of the action. And leaving the assistant secretary, even the regional <coughs> assistant secretary, open to responsibility without authority. And how does one break through the Praetorian Guard surrounding the post Schultz and Kissinger secretaries of state? How do you make those points to them when they're surrounded by people <laughs> intent on spending all of these ideas? I, I, all of you, I'm going over to the seventh floor tomorrow. I'll talk, I'll talk to somebody. But, um, <laughs> I don't lay it on me, David, though. Well, will they listen? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> and that's kind of my, my conclusion, Susan. It's a pessimistic one, and it's, it's an argument. But I think that um, there are perils out there in the world of states, whether they're in Ukraine or Syria or you, you, name, you name the country, right? It's a complicated place out there. We have institutions that can manage these, 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 these platforms and bases, we call embassies. We have, uh, there are authorities at the top of these things that are adequate to doing that. But in order for that to happen, there needs to be a sense of, there, needs to, there need to be people who have done this, who have seen, seen it done, who know it can be done carefully, um, and with due regard for the sensitivities and the prerogatives of other agencies, but who know that there is no substitute for having somebody in charge. I mean, there's nobody like this, right, in, in Washington. Uh, it, it, stops at, it stops at the president's desk here. Overseas, it stops at the desk of the ambassador or the chief of mission. Whoever the hell has the, has the uh, legal authority for running that place? Gordon. Uh, Larry, in the meantime, the, our friends at the Defense Department are yeah. busy thinking about Pre-conflict and post-conflict, they've learned all the wrong lessons from, in many ways, from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, they learned them partway, and then they got hooked on yep. the role of government, and, and they're yep. busy thinking bilaterally and regionally. Yes, uh, sure. But I get the impression when I talk to them that they think that string is kind of running out, and they wonder what the next phase is. I, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know what their next phase is. I, I mean, as I suggested, they overlearned the lesson that that. that you know, war is a branch of politics that they had forgotten uh, in in 2002. They've since overlearned it, so they're active all of. We got special forces in 100 countries around the world on on a, on a, on, a, on, a, on a given day. David knows this far better than I do. Um, they're, ac they're active. They're 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 in the world. But I guess I would say on my on the basis of my own very modest experience in Libya recently with the newly created Africa, Africa Command, AFRICOM, and its, and its uh, commanding general, Carter Ham, there is plenty of room for dialogue and indeed for defer, you know, deference to the, to the guy on the spot, still within the military institution. And I, I, I'm not sure that that, so I would say the fault is, you know, not so much in the four stars, but in ourselves, if we're underlings. <laughs> Go on with that one. Well, yeah. <laughs>
How are we doing? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes, sir. The perhaps the opposite of reliance on Twitter and Facebook yeah. would be what I saw actually still could work in Afghanistan and Iraq, which is you go out and you meet with people. <laughs> and the Foreign Service at its best can still offer an amazing combination of area expertise, language competence, and the ability to deal with foreigners and the interagency in ambiguous situations. Uh, the, what I'd like to ask you is, given where you've served, including your recent service in, in uh, Libya, how do you see this, uh, this intersection of leadership, the need to go out, and the change security uh, tolerance atmosphere? Yeah. The, um, the military has a, has a saying, which is that force protection is not a mission. In other words, if all you're doing is sitting around in the compound staying safe, you might as well not be there. Too often that's become, I mean, I'm afraid, and I, 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 de I declined opportunities to, to distinguish myself in Iraq. I, I, I was sat in, in Portland, Maine, and, and wrote a uh, little consulting for the Defense Department and wrote scholarly books that nobody read. But I do know that, you know, uh, compound living is kind of a disease that's affected a lot of, a lot of folks who, who served in those places who can't imagine anything different. And this is this is to slander a whole generation, and that's not the right way. That's not that's not true. But I was struck by the way in which the ARB, headed by Tom Pickering, who certainly knows better, certainly knows better, if anybody does, reiterated this mantra about security and higher walls and more Marines and more barbed wire, as if you could eliminate risk from the business. And there is a obey. There's a sort of a nod in the direction in the ARB report. To the, to, to, the, to the idea that diplomacy involves risk. Ron Newman has been you know, writing about this very well. But it institutionalized, I used to do counterterrorism over, over there. The easiest course for any bureaucrat at any time is to, is to, take, this, to take the safe way up. And just, just, you know, you know, withdraw the staff, put out the travel advisory, warn people about, about formless fears that are that are may or may not transpire because if they do if they do come to bet, come to pass, then it's not on your watch and it's not your fault. And we've got a whole huge bureaucracy over there and over here over there called the Bureau of Diplomatic Security, which has grown very very great. Um, and it's it's a law. It may not be a law enforcement agency as it thinks that it is, but it's certainly a law unto itself in a lot of ways. How you reverse that, I do not know. And with, with respect to, you know, the good RSOs around the world who understand that the mission has to come first, everything is driving us in, the, in, in a different direction. Everything. Everything. And part of it is the fact that diplomacy doesn't matter very much. What the heck, why should we have these people at, at risk out there? What are they really doing that is, that is, in, that is in improving our security? Aren't they all anachronisms anyway? Uh, in the age of in the information age, so that's I think we've got to. That's something that has to be fought, and maybe in our own minds, maybe most importantly in our own minds. And somebody was suggesting, you know, how do we reverse this within the current foreign service? I'm afraid that many people, again, sort of tar with one brush is is, is not right. But I I worked with a, a wonderful officer in Libya in the foreign service for. 10 years. And he said to me, nobody ever told me you could do this. Right? Wonderful guy. Great guy. Um, well, that something's going on there that isn't healthy for the institution. When a, when a fine, courageous, hardworking, tough officer can say, nobody ever told me you could do this. And when what this was, was sort of asserting control and a degree of leadership in the cannons. I was there for three months, and uh, uh, it was an honor to serve again for a brief time. Okay. One last question. Any? You're not out of the hunt. No. Thank you well, all thank very, you. very much.